Auto sequence start. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. Welcome to the Launchpad. I'm your host, Harry Washington. And those of you new to the show, um, the show is sponsored by Pursuing a Dream Corporation. Pursuing a Dream Corporation is a nonprofit organization that encourages students to pursue degrees in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and math. Today's segment is focused on aviation. For those of you unfamiliar with aviation, it's flying. So we're going to take a look at this topic in depth by talking with a number of guests. Our first guest today is Colonel Richard Cooper of the Civil Air Patrol. Welcome to the show. And thank Cooper. you, sir. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, what is the mission of the Civil Air Patrol, for those who are familiar with the organization? The Civil Air Patrol has three missions. Okay. One is emergency services. Mm -hmm. yeah, the second one is aerospace, and the third is cadet programs. How long have you been a member of the organization? I was a cadet in high school, mm -hmm. and I came back in 91, and I've been uh, continuously active right. since 91. And what interests you in joining Civil Air Patrol? Uh, I was always interested in flying. Uh, as a kid, I used to ride, ride my bike over the National Airport and watch aircraft. And then uh, when I was in my junior year of high school, one of my buddies came and told me about the Civil Air Patrol. Mm -hmm. And so he told me it was about flying. And as soon as he said flying, mm -hmm. I said, OK, I will go take a look. And so. My junior and senior year, I was a CAP cadet. Now, in your opinion, why are there fewer African-American pilots? What I think one of the reasons is they aren't exposed to it. Okay. And another reason could be the expense of learning how to fly. Learning how to fly is very expensive. I mean, there are ways of making it cheaper, but if you just go straight forward, flying is expensive. Now, how do you, uh, well, take us through the process. How do you become a pilot? Okay, first of all, you have to get a medical uh, from a certified uh, flight examiner. And the lowest uh, rating is third class. And, and basically, it's to make sure uh, you do not have illnesses like color blindness, uh, vertigo, things okay. like that. Okay. After that, uh, you need 40 hours, a minimum of 40 hours of flying time, and that includes dual instructions, okay. solo, cross country, okay. which is 50 miles okay. uh, out and back, okay. um, and also night flying and some other um, parts of flying. So I mean, those that are interested in flying, uh, should they just join the military, or what other ways can they learn how to fly or get these hours? Uh, you can start early. Um, Civil Air Patrol has a flying program. Uh, basically what we do is we have a flight academy mm -hmm. and it varies across the country. Uh, in ours, which is the Middle East region, we give 10 hours of flying time, okay. plus we give ground school. And if you, if you are successful enough after eight hours of flying mm -hmm. and with the uh, signing off by your instructor, mm -hmm you are able to attempt to solo. Because, now you mentioned the cadet program, in which you said you, you were part of as well. Yes. Um, explain, what, what, what is the cadet program? Cadet program, we take young men and young women between the ages of 12 and 20. Okay. And as being part of the program, they will learn, they will be part of the emergency services team. Okay. Uh, they will get a lot of knowledge about aerospace, not only from the pilot side, but also jobs within the aerospace umbrella. Excellent. And we also have a tremendous leadership program. And basically what the leadership program does is teach you how to interact 
with others, you know, not your peers, because okay. once you graduate, your peers are going to diminish mm -hmm. and new people will come into your life. And so we have it at the squadron level, which is the lowest level. Okay. Then we have it at the regional okay. level. And if you become an officer and you're eligible, you can go down to Maxwell Air Force Base to uh, the Air University and, you know, increase your, your skills uh, in becoming a leader. Now, how now, because you said you start the ages are between 12 and 20. How long do you, does a cadet stay in the program? A cadet can stay in, in the program until they reach 21. If oh, wow. They have to be in by 18. Okay. Okay, so if they come in before 18, they can stay until they're 21. Now, what other programs does the Civil Air Patrol have that particularly focus on science, technology, engineering, and math? Because I know you talk about the aerospace program. Uh, yes. F uh, for the school system, we have a STEM certified uh, system. Okay. And one, one of the uh, programs is ACE, which is uh, Aerospace Connection mm -hmm. to Education. And that covers kindergarten through the sixth grade. Okay. The other one is um, AEX, which is Aerospace for Excellence. And that will cover sixth grade through the 12th grade. Okay. And that program, just like the ACE program, has many hands-on activities. Okay. Um, and a lot of the activities are, do not cost anything. Uh, for instance, if I want to talk about Bernoulli mm -hmm. and uh, Sir Isaac Newton, when it comes to flying, mm -hmm. all I need is a CD, a bottle cap mm -hmm. from a drinking bottle of water, close the cap, a okay. balloon, seal it, okay. blow up the balloon, open the cap, and let it go. Okay. And, and what the disc will do is glide across the table oh, on a column of air. And what I always tell the uh, young people, it's not magic, it's science. Right. And also have them do, a, depending on the age group, if mm -hmm. it's second graders or third graders, then I will have them at least know who Isaac Newton is right. and at least have some idea uh, what, what their uh, theories were. So now, in closing, because I, I, we talked b before the segment, a lot of students get this um, depiction of flying as video games, you know, these fighting, and, um, you know. Is it that exciting? Uh, I can't relate to it. Uh, it can be, but looking at World War II mm -hmm. fighter pilots, when you had to be up close and personal, you okay. had to see the enemy. Okay. And if that person got on your tail, your survival meant that you had to outfly that person. Mm -hmm. And if you got on that person's tail, you had to outfly them if you wanted to shoot them down. Right. Video games are interesting. As a matter of fact, I, I play video games from okay. time to time. <laughs> and okay. it's, it's, it's a challenge. Okay. So any final words for our viewers? Now, one of the things I would really like people to do is look at our program. Okay. Because it really broadens the picture of what's out there for the young people coming up today. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times people will gravitate towards what they see in their community and, and that's it. But aerospace covers a lot of jobs. I mean, not only pilots, but uh, doctors and chemists and, mm -hmm. and metallurgists and, and things like that. Okay. So there, there are a lot of jobs underneath the umbrella. And with the baby boomers retiring, there's mm -hmm. going to be a tremendous vacuum. Exactly. And, and I think that uh, we owe it to them to add aerospace to the curriculum or at least, at least make the um, young people aware that there are jobs out there. Okay. Now, uh, the other thing is that we, um, I saw that the Civil Air Patrol did participate in the Science Engineering Festival in 2011. Yes. Are there any current events that you guys have? Uh, right well, for teachers um, who join the program, we mm -hmm. have, uh, we have a, a flight program for the teachers. Okay. It's like a one hour, uh, well, it's about a half a day syllabus on my, what makes an airplane fly okay. and the instruments. Okay. And then if we have two teachers, we will f fly one hour up front for one, I okay. mean half an hour for one up front okay. and half an hour coming back. If they join, uh, 
as an aerospace member. During the summertime, we have a conference, okay. uh, and, and it depends on where it is. It's around the United States. And basically, they can get college credit okay. for uh, these conferences. And there's a, there are a lot of hands-on activities that, that they can do. Excellent. I would like to thank uh, Colonel Cooper for joining us. We'll be back. Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm your host, Harry Washington. And in continuing with our show about aviation, we're joined today by Mrs. Chelsea Dorman, who works with the College Park Aviation Museum. Chelsea, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, tell us a little bit more about your title at the College Park Aviation Museum. Well, I've worked pretty much in just about every capacity I can at the Aviation Museum over the past couple of years. Um, but I've primarily been doing education, so we do a lot of uh, museum tours for school groups, scout groups, red hat groups. Um, okay. So I work in that capacity and also as uh, coordinating programs that we offer, so special programs, um, you know, special events, and ongoing programs like our Peter Pan Club. How long has the Aviation Museum been in existence? Uh, we've been in our current building since 1998, so mm -hmm. we're in our uh, 15th year there. Okay. Uh, and prior to that, we were in a small building uh, next to the operations building. So we've been around for a while. Now, now what's the goal of the museum, and how do, are those goals accomplished? Well, we're on the grounds of the oldest continually operating airport in the world, the College Park Airport. Okay. Uh, it opened in 1909 when mm -hmm. the Army had bought an airplane from the Wright brothers, and they okay. needed a place to learn how to fly it. Okay. Um, so the Army came out to College Park Airport, and we've been open ever since. And so we have a century of aviation history um, mm -hmm. that we try to tell. That's uh, the goal of the museum, is to share that history. Um, we're known as the field of firsts because okay. Getting started off uh, early on, uh, mm -hmm. you get a lot of firsts, such as you know the first machine gun fired from an airplane. Wow. Um, we had the uh, first bomb dropping from an airplane, or bomb use of a bomb site from okay. an airplane. First person to fly one mile high. Mm -hmm. uh, first use of radio navigational aids. First <laughs> mail, uh, air mail service offered uh, by the post office. Okay. All sorts of uh, uh, firsts like that, and we offer lots of great educational programs, tours, school tours, like I mentioned, uh, to share that story. Now, in saying all that, what, do you, what would you say the most interesting thing is at the Aviation Museum? The most interesting thing. <laughs> uh, well, like I said, we have this fantastic history, so it's really hard to pick just one thing. Okay. Um, but when visitors come to the museum, a lot of them really love to go into our hands-on room uh, okay. because it's uh, got a lot of really great interactives. Okay. We have some flight simulators that everyone likes oh, to actually. try out. And if you want to try dressing up like a pilot from mm -hmm. back in the day, mm -hmm. we have dress-ups that you can try on as well. Um, but we have lots of great interactives you know, all throughout the museum, helping to tell us the story of you know, how College Park Airport has changed from when we first opened to where we are today. Now, how often does the museum host events? We have them very regularly. We have our Peter Pan Club, like I mentioned earlier, which okay. is the second and fourth Thursdays of okay. the month, and that's a great program for uh, young kids. Okay. Um, we'll do a story time and a craft that they get to take home after that. Okay. Um, but we also have a couple of big events coming up. We have our Haunted Hangar event coming yeah. up for Halloween, so okay. the museum will be open late, and you can come in your Halloween costume okay. and do all sorts of Halloween crafts and fun stuff. Um, we have rib-making workshops. You can learn to make the airplane rib for a right Brothers airplane and mm -hmm. take that home with you. Okay. Uh, we have Santa fly in where Santa will come in on a helicopter. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, of course, we have uh, holiday trains and planes. So we'll have mm -hmm. um, a train set up uh, it's the week of December 14th. Now, you said uh, the museum will be open later. Now, what are the normal hours of the, uh, the museum? We're open 10 until 5 every day, except for major holidays. So it'll be closed Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Day. So, how long will the museum be open for the um, Halloween? Uh, so event. our Halloween event goes 7 to 9 p.m. Oh, wow. Yeah, so oh. you get to the airport at night. That's one of the great features of our museum is that we have an entire wall of windows, mm -hmm. and you can see the uh, runway from the airport and see exactly what's happening out there. Now, how can um, individuals assist in the operation of the museum? Uh, we have lots of volunteer opportunities. Like I said, we're open every day, so we rely on our volunteers to help us at the front desk and uh, assisting visitors through the door. They also help us with these special events. Okay. Um, so we you know, really rely on them for that. But we also have our uh, Friends Foundation. It's called the Field of Firsts Foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, and they raise funds for new uh, education programs and okay. exhibits for us. So what's the, the youngest that you've accepted as a volunteer? Uh, 
uh, starting at age 16, I believe. Okay, yeah. so students yeah. can volunteer. Yes, yeah, students get community can volunteer. Service. If you need your volunteer hours, oh, you can right. uh, check out the website, collegeparkaviationmuseum.com, and, and they'll be on there. So now, I mean, of all this exciting stuff at the Aviation Museum, and I'm sure those who haven't done so will. What is, are there any new attractions or any uh, new events that's going to be occurring at the museum? Well, our, we have the events going on that I mentioned previously, right. but we also have our uh, Rescue of College Park Airport exhibit, okay. which just recently opened. Okay. And that's uh, telling the story of College Park Airport in the 60s and 70s, when there was really um, an effort by citizens nearby to revive the airport and get uh, the Park and Planning Commission to buy it and you know mm -hmm. restore it to its former glory. Excellent. Anything else in closing you want to say, Chelsea? Uh, just, it's a really great museum. We're open every day, so you should really come out and check us out. We have uh, events going on all the time, so feel free to come on out and join us for any of those events. <laughs> We'd like to thank Chelsea for joining us. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Launchpad. Again, I'm your host, Harry Washington, and this is our Career Spotlight segment, where we're very fortunate to be joined by uh, Commander Lacey, who's a U.S. Navy pilot. Commander Lacey, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Give our guests a little uh, background on you. Uh, well, I'm from the local area, from uh, Atlanta, Maryland. Mm -hmm. I went to Eleanor Roosevelt High School, graduated from the Science and Technology Program. Okay. Went to uh, University, uh, excuse me, went to the United States Naval Academy, uh, Annapolis, Maryland. And from there, I went through the Navy's flight training program to get my coveted wings of gold as a Navy pilot. And I've been flying in combat, overseas missions uh, for the past 16 years uh, in a variety of places, uh, most you know, predominantly in the Middle East or in the former Yugoslavia. How many years have you been a pilot? Uh, 16 years. And has most of that experience been in the United States Navy? Yes. Okay. Uh, what, are, what are some of the assignments? Give our uh, audience an uh, idea. What are some of the assignments that you've had in the United States Navy? Uh, most of my assignments have been in uh, maritime patrol aircraft, which are, are traditionally submarine hunting aircraft uh, based out of Jacksonville, Florida. And from there, we deploy to different places around the world, either uh, Japan, Middle East, Africa, uh, some places in South America and Europe as well. Now, what interests you in the field of aviation? Uh, when I, actually, when I was a kid, I grew up watching movies such as Top Gun or Officer and okay. Gentleman. And uh, I used to go to uh, air shows here at Andrews Air Force Base mm -hmm. and uh, additionally to the uh, Air and Space Museum and just being able to sit in different airplanes, walk through them, mm -hmm. and develop a passion for aviation that never went away. Now, um, what, how much, I'm sorry, how much experience is necessary to become a pilot? Uh, well, for me, it was about a year of actual training to get my wings of gold. Okay. Uh, in that year, you will... Um, you will have a lot of classroom instruction, a lot of time with uh, flying the flight simulator. Mm -hmm. uh, you, they will actually do some war survival training with you where they will put you in a mock-up airplane underwater oh, wow. and teach you how to get out of it. Okay. Uh, and there's several maneuvers you have to perform uh, in the air as well as different types of landings that we need to be able to perform and perform well. Now, give, us, uh, give our audience an idea. How much time is spent in the classroom and how much time is spent in the air? I'd say it's, a, it's an equal mix because they make sure that they teach you everything about the systems on board the aircraft and the procedures, and you have to know that and know that well before you can ever, you know, set foot on board an airplane and, you know, waste taxpayers' money with going out and flying. Right. Uh, what are some of the career obstacles that you've encountered and since being a pilot? Uh, well, every time I, I learn a new airplane, you encounter new challenges you have to overcome. Uh, with that, uh, with learning a new plane, you have to study that plane, be proficient demonstrate that proficiency to your flight instructor before you can ever fly by yourself. Uh, as well as uh, many of the mid-flight uh, mm -hmm. issues that arise almost every flight. Uh, wow. Sometimes uh, you have to perform emergency landings, you have to shut down an engine and land uh, with an emergency, or you have to go to a divert airfield because there's a problem with the airfields as you intended on landing at. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as mission changes. Sometimes you plan to go out on a mission mm -hmm. and mid-flight. They will call you on the radio and tell you that your mission has changed, wow. and now you have to go proceed on a different type of mission. So, I mean, just in your career, how many times has that happened to you? Maybe changing, um, changing missions or emergency, um, uh, emergency landings? I'd say for a military aviator, that, that occurs probably once a month, where your mission is changing or you're doing some type of uh, uh, emergency landing. Now, what would you say were some of the skills that you've gained through school that benefit you in your career? Uh, I think um, going to some of the uh, going through some of the science and technology courses at Eleanor Roosevelt uh, really prepared me. Uh, the ones that you can get at almost any school are the advanced level, level algebras, uh, physics, um, geometry type of classes. Those are the ones that are really going to prepare you um, for, like in my case, going to the Naval Academy or going through flight training. And um, I, I guess the other thing in terms of uh, school, were you a great student? Uh, I try to be a great <laughs> student. I wasn't the, uh, the best student, but no, they, uh, you don't have to be a straight-A student. Right. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing is being able to manage 
all the requirements that are coming at you. But no, they don't require you to be a straight A student okay. and uh, you don't have to go through a science technology program. All those STEM uh, courses are preferred. Mm -hmm. It's not a requirement. What advice would you give to students who are thinking about or considering the aviation field? I think the big thing is to read a lot of books about aviation. Okay. Uh, go to air shows, the local military bases. Mm -hmm. uh, go to the Air and Space Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a small airport uh, nearby mm -hmm. uh, and you can, uh, rent some time to go and uh, get some flight instruction, okay. uh, do that. Uh, sitting in the back of an airliner is very different than you actually flying an airplane. It feels completely different, mm -hmm. it looks different. So uh, the big thing is going out and trying to experience that firsthand mm -hmm. and it may spark that interest in aviation. What was your first flying experience like for you? Uh, I was pretty scared. The first time I was in an airplane <laughs> was actually in the Navy okay. uh, and uh, that was my first flight ever and it took me a while to get used to actually flying. Because what kind of plane was it that you uh, It's a T-34 Turbo Mentor. We no longer fly it, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a single engine trainer, small orange and white plane, okay. uh, much faster than some of the, uh, the Cessnas uh, that you, you have at uh, smaller airports, okay. uh, but it's meant to go out and teach uh, student pilots how to perform these maneuvers and landings well before you move on to bigger and faster type airplanes. How many, um, in terms of African American pilots, have you come across in your career? Honestly, very few. Uh, we are about 1% uh, of uh, right. military aviation or the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. Those numbers have not changed uh, throughout the past few decades. Mm -hmm. uh, and quite frankly, there's just not enough of us out there doing it. But what do you think is some of the causes? Because we asked previous guests this, but what do you think some of the causes are for African Americans not to be, become that interest in aviation? Is it the, the coursework? Is it just maybe the perception of it, of the field? Or? Um, I think that uh, primarily it's the exposure and the numbers of people that are coming in the door. It's not okay. people getting in and not performing well. It's just the number of people that are applying and asking for it. So okay. for me, I do a lot of outreach with going out to different schools, right. trying to expose kids right. uh, to aviation so they can see a pod that looks like me and understand that it is possible. How, how do you make it interesting for them? I mean, considering all the experience that you've had, how, how do you make it interesting? For the students? Yes. Uh, I just come in and share my experiences with them and, uh, and just be down to earth and explain to them, you know, that hey, I'm from the local area, explain mm -hmm. to them about uh, going to the same schools that they went to mm -hmm. and, uh, and sharing with them that you, you don't need to uh, spend money to go flying. You don't have to go uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to get your private pilot's license. Gotcha. Uh, you don't need to spend a whole lot of money in this, but you just need to have a passion for flying. So uh, going to different bases, going to air shows, reading books, watching the movies, going okay. to the museums is a great way to, to learn as much as you can about it. So you watch Top Gun also? All the time. <laughs> Too many times. What, um, what advice, well, I mean, just in closing, um, how do you think we can influence, what can educators do to, um, to influence students to become more interested? Not maybe just in flying, but just aviation careers. Sure. As far as being a pilot, that's something you have to really want deep within yourself. I think that uh, what educators and what parents can do is be supportive. They can take kids to these different air shows. They can take them to these museums. Um, and if kids ask, hey, can I, can I get a couple hours of flight instruction, mm -hmm. you know, pay for that. Uh, okay. you, you know, that's one way that, you know, parents can go about doing it. Another way is um, if you run across a pilot, you know, just ask them, hey, is there any way you can come speak to my middle school, speak to my high school, speak to my son, mm -hmm. and just provide that exposure to them. You're not going to influence them to want to be a pilot, but at right. least you're providing that exposure, mm -hmm. and they know it's possible that they can be an aviator. Cool. We'd like to thank our guest, uh, Lieutenant, I'm sorry, Commander Lacey, um, and all the guests that we've had today. To learn more about them, you can visit our credits at the end of the show. But stay tuned, because we got a special video which talks about how to fly. Well, when we fly the aircraft, we basically can control it in three axes. We control it in a pitch axis, up and down. We control it in a roll axis, left and right. And we control it in a yaw axis, also left and right. So to control the aircraft to get it to roll or bank, we use what we call ailerons on either end of the wing. When we want the aircraft to turn, we're generally changing the direction of lift from straight up and down or perpendicular to the wing now into the direction that we want to turn. For example, if we want to turn to the, le uh, the right, we're going to bank the aircraft and change that lift from straight up and down now to the right. Now we're going to use the aileron here. To make the aircraft go to the right, I'm going to turn the yoke to the right or the wheel and it's going to raise this aileron. It's also going to lower the one on the opposite wing. 
and that's going to make the aircraft tilt to the right. Now if we want to go to the left, we can turn the yoke or the wheel to the left and that will lower the aileron on this wing and raise it on that wing. So that's how we get the aircraft to bank or roll. Now moving here down to the tail, we have the elevator and the rudder. The elevator is what we use to get the aircraft to pitch up and down. When we want the aircraft to climb or pitch up, we pull back on the yoke and that raises the elevator on the tail and we start to go up. When we want the plane to go down, we push forward on the yoke and that lowers the elevator and we start to go down. The rudder is controlled by pedals on the floor. Left pedal makes the rudder go to the left and the nose to the left. Right rudder makes the rudder go to the right. This again is the yoke, also called the wheel or the control column or multiple different names. But this is going to be what we use to control the aircraft in that pitch up and down uh, axis and the roll left and right axis. When we want to go up, we pull the yoke towards us, and again that raises the elevator, and we start to go up. When we want to go down, we push the yoke away from us, and it lowers the elevator, and we start to go down. To roll the aircraft left and right, we just turn the wheel or the yoke to the right to go right, and to go back to the left, we turn the yoke to the left. On the floor, you can see the pedals. The pedals control the rudder on the tail and also the nose wheel. Left pedal makes the nose go left and right pedal makes the nose go right. On top of the pedals we have brakes so when we're on the ground if we push it up on the top of the pedal we put the brakes on and help us come to a stop. Starting from the left we have the airspeed indicator. It shows us how fast we're moving through the air. Again, the aircraft is going to generally cruise right about 100 knots. This is the artificial horizon indicator, which gives us a miniature example of what we can actually see outside of us on the horizon. This is the altimeter. The long needle is in 100 increments, and the short needle is in thousands. And it shows us how far we are above sea level. This is the turn coordinator, and this little level here at the bottom is what we use to help us determine if we have enough pedal. We want to keep the ball, this little ball here in the center of the level, when we're flying. If it's out to the left or right, we need more left or right pedal. This is the heading indicator. Shows us which way we're heading in a magnetic direction off magnetic north. This is the vertical speed indicator and it shows us how fast we're climbing or descending. I'm also a pilot in the Army Reserve and I fly helicopters. And I've been flying, teaching flight instruction for about 15 years. And the last thing I want to talk about is sort of the process about learning to fly. The FAA requires that anybody that's interested in learning to fly be at least 17 years old and be able to get a medical certificate. As far as the minimum amount of experience, each person has to have at least 35 hours of flight time, of which about 15 hours by yourself, solo in the airplane with just you, and about 20 hours with an instructor. Now most people, it takes them a little bit more than that 35 hours. It takes them close to probably 65 to 70 hours to really get comfortable. But once they're comfortable and they can complete all the required maneuvers to the FAA standards, then they can go take their check ride. So all told again about 70 hours or so and uh, hopefully a lot of fun on the way.